I was pastoring a larger church at the time. A knock came on the door and a girl was standing on the other side as I opened it. And I knew who it was. It was someone that we had already uh, prayed about, had gone after, discussed things with. She had infiltrated a local church in the greater Akron area. She claimed that she was into Satanism. She had tattooed on her left wrist, War on the Saints. I saw the harm that she was doing, and I began to counter the things that she was doing to that local church and began to talk to the pastor about it. In dealing with this girl, she gave me her book of shadows that described in detail how she was uh, infiltrating and working in this lo local church, some of the things and tactics that she used. But this day she was at my church. I was pastoring a larger church at the time and there she stood and she said she had just stopped by to talk. I don't know how she got past the office. Somehow she would snuck through the building and came directly to my door. I let her come in with the door open and sat there on a couch and uh, began to talk to her a little bit, ask her what she needed, what was wrong, what was going on. And she talked to me ab about a number of things that day and then all of a sudden she had to leave. And she left out of the building, and I stood there with a real weird sense that all the discussion and talk was a diversion, that something else was going on, that uh, there was some other plot afoot. So I went over by the couch, and I knelt down in my usual place to pray, and I began to pray, and I began to seek the Lord about it, and I looked over to my right and stuffed into the side of my uh, creases of the couch was two black satanic power rings that she had wore and talked about. I mean, this is something that she believed that she was able to take and uh, charge or or demonize in, in ritual and, and have powers on. And it was objects she was going to leave in my office that was supposed to have demonic presence and power over it and was to uh, somehow influence me. She had come that day, and uh, not to talk about anything, but completely... Uh, her reason was simply to leave those demonized objects in my office because I was uh, interfering with what she was doing at another local church. Let me tell you something about that local church. It began with her showing up and leaving little notes in the, in the offering plate, uh, pentagrams and different statements uh, coming from what she said was a Satanist. She didn't say who it was. I mean, she went forward in church and she went to the pastor and began to talk to the pastor. Out of nowhere, she showed up. And uh, she was needy and she was uh, uh, in a victim of, of satanic stuff. And the pastor began to deal with her and pray with her and deal with things. What they did not know uh, was how sophisticated she was and that she was sent that she was being used by the local coven also and that they had a target concerning the pastor and his wife in that local church. When the pastor first called me about it and then told me where she lived, I went over to see her and I knocked on the door and she came down. I told her where I was and uh, as I explained a few things to her and asked her a few questions, she became angry with me. I said I was going to pray for her. She cussed me out, of course, and she ran up the stairs. At this local church... She befriended the pastor. She befriended somehow. She became such a, an inside person there. She would come to the offices and she was helping out. She was at the pastor's home when he would get home from work. And uh, she was playing with the kids. She was involved in the youth group. Later she confessed how as an infiltrator she was there to seduce the kids with sex and take them off to some uh, black metal music uh, parties and eventually draw them into occultism. While she was there, the, the coven around was also putting curses and doing satanic warfare. She was eventually caught doing an actual satanic uh, ritual, uh, desecration ritual on the inside of the church building. It is true that that pastor eventually fell and, and uh, the pastor and his wife divorced and, and it seemed like that church was scrambled for, for a period of time. We confronted the girl and eventually she left the area and the amazing thing was is that um, on the outward this person seemed like they had great need and great uh, you know wanted help and everything else but as you began to observe and began to help uh, she was receiving none of it. It was all simply a uh, false presentation. It was a ruse. 
And this is what is happening in many hundreds of churches across the United States of America. It's been happening all across the board. The infiltration of Christian churches. Hey, this is Russ Dizdar from the organization Shatter the Darkness. We're found on the web, www.shatterthedarkness.net. And I'm going to tell you today about uh, an increasing problem. It's been going on for the last 30 years. And I really believe that there's been churches all over now that we've been called to many of them that have been blown out of the waters because of uh, these satanic, quote, chosen ones, or satanic super soldiers, who've been um, targeting churches and targeting ministers and targeting you know, local congregations to go in and to uh, literally do a, a satanic black ops uh, project on a local church to uh, bring it into confusion, to challenge its powers, and to see what kind of destruction and corruption uh, they can bring to a local fellowship. In dealing with this over a period of time now, we've seen the mode of operation. Like we're taught again in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where we're not to be unaware of Satan's methods, his schemes, my friends. He has a scheme, he has a method. We're not to be outwitted. But I'm going to tell you right now that some of the most sophisticated, highly trained satanic warrior monks are among us, and they're in our churches. If you remember the parable of the sower, and the sower goes out to sow the word of God, and individuals receive that word, and the wheat begin to grow, Christians begin to grow. And then the counter to that is the evil one comes during the night, and he also sows his word, and tares. And the tares begin to grow up right among the wheat. Infiltration of Christian churches. Now, you, listen, you might think church is all about just gathering together and worshiping and being blessed and, and hearing the Word of God and worshiping and having great friendship. You know, one, one man told me years ago, he says, listen, I don't want to know about any problems in the church. All I want to do after my 40 hours of work during the week is to show up at church and for church to be like a great sanctuary and just to be blessed and to receive God's blessing." And I understand that. I really do. I've been a pastor over 30 years and uh, pastored uh, four specific churches, uh, both large and small, tough and great. And listen, I've seen uh, many things in all those years. But in our um, work with the organization Shadow of the Darkness uh, for the last 20-some years, we have tracked this issue of infiltration. We have engaged those who have clearly infiltrated uh, Christian ministries and counseling centers and churches. And I'm here to tell you right now that there are hundreds of thousands of highly trained, satanic, they call themselves chosen ones. They have multiple personality disorder mixed with satanic ritual abuse. That's what the secular world calls it. What we don't realize in the body of Christ is that they were split, uh, human personality was split purposely. Uh, they have been trained on the inside with sub-level personalities, demonized, and uh, been trained over the years. A lot of training. Now listen, I can't go into everything about this. I've got a three-hour seminar called The Black Awakening all about where they've come from. There's over four million diagnosed cases of this thing people are calling multiple personality disorder or a DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder. And I want to tell you something that uh, there's probably another four or five million undiagnosed cases. So we're approaching somewhere around 10 million. We spoke this out in 1992 and 1994 in seminars we did on spiritual warfare and on this very issue. And uh, it's hard to believe that there would be that many highly trained. I'm not talking about just Satanists that go out and, and uh, say a few Enochian chants and get a hold of Anton LaVey's uh, Satanic Bible. I'm talking about transgenerational, uh, highly trained but highly, highly empowered uh, satanic warrior monks. They've been placed. They've been placed in government, in military. They've been placed in law enforcement, in society, in educational areas. And they've clearly infiltrated, by placement, by design, local Christian churches all over the place. We've dealt with them. We've been to church after church after church. 
I've been to places where we've spoke on this subject and all of a sudden I've watched pastors and leaders and counselors and others look at me and they begin to shake their hand, heads yes and look at each other realizing that the headaches and that the sickness and that the plundering and the things going on, the diversions and the divisions and, and everything else, the compromising and all the stuff that was going on in the divisions and, and everything else, the compromising and all the stuff that was going on in their churches was uh, by design. The check that they felt, uh, the the perceptions that they were, give, were getting from the Lord were absolutely real. And uh, they should have been followed up. Let me tell you about infiltration. It's not a new thing at all. I mean, we can see this in the Old Testament concerning Israel and the battles that they continue to have back and forth with uh, demon-worshipping nations. But specifically coming to the New Testament. Coming to the New Testament, I mean, the nature of the church uh, tells us that it's engaged in a life and death, heaven and hell, a struggle for the souls of men. Jesus said in the book of Matthew, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Now listen again. Jesus will build the church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. The idea is that the, the gates of hell shall not withstand the onslaught of the church. That means that there would be, though, a battle. That every soul we win and every advance the kingdom of God takes, uh, there is a spiritual battle. I mean, the Spirit of God tried to uh, speak to us very in very clear terms in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, that our struggle, our battle, even within churches, is not uh, flesh and blood, but there are spiritual forces operating and working. Now, we might understand this as an invisible war, but real. But I want to tell you that there's something even more tangible. The invisible war has recruited um, the human level. And that there are, well, Father Shefton acknowledges that there may be a hundred thousand covens in his book on Satanism. A hundred thousand covens in the United States. And uh, we should expect these kind of things through biblical prophecy concerning the last days. But let me tell you again, the infiltration is a satanic idea. Who would want to infiltrate the church? Who would want to go into the church and infiltrate it? And what are the reasons that anybody would want to infiltrate the Christian church? Uh, we were teaching one night, and a gathering had come from um, people from different churches, other places. And we were talking a little bit about this concept here. And all of a sudden, uh, a brother in Christ, some that we knew from another large church, a very large church, spoke up and he said, Listen, Russ. He said, uh, the amazing thing was that I was taken once to a meeting uh, at a Masonic temple. And I was invited to come, and, and I happened to come in to another room, and, uh, and by accident, he said, I think it was by providence, he said, I began to listen to some man who was speaking to another group. And as that man began to speak, he named my church. That man was in some what of the leadership of the church that I was at, but he was at a Masonic temple in a meeting telling the rest of the fellas the goings-on of the inside of my local church. The financial records, the different things with leadership, what the plans were. He was literally giving them information that he had, uh, that he had scooped up from our local church from the inside. And, and he was giving it. He says, I don't know what they were going to use it for. I don't know why they were doing it. But they were informing um, Masons concerning the ongoing uh, work in a local, very high-profile local church. Now, I thought it was an amazing thing. In the Word of God, we remember the story in Acts chapter 5 of Ananias and Sapphira. And they had in their heart a conspiracy going on, and they, and they had a lie going on. And as a matter of fact, the word used uh, in, the, in the text there is, comes from a Greek word that means that they were going to test the durability of the church to see if they could pull the wool over the eyes of the church. If you read Acts chapter 5, you can read about Ananias and Sapphira, how Satan entered their lives and so filled their hearts that they would lie to God the Holy Spirit and uh, that they would allow Satan to enter into them for the sake of infiltrating the church to test the durability of the church and perhaps pull the wool over the eyes of the church. Listen, if you're a Christian, you've got to understand what Jesus was talking about when uh, he was talking about end-time issues. The number one uh, 
doctrinal issue was don't be deceived, don't be seduced. That uh, that false prophets, false teachers, others would come in among you to deceive you in the elect, to deceive with counterfeit signs, wonders, and miracles, whatever else, even deceive believers. Don't think that Satan will not show up in your church. You can claim all you want to. Oh man, we've got a bloodline around our church that there's nothing going to happen here. Listen, if someone comes in that has demonic attachment, they're carrying that right into your body. Not that you should be afraid. I mean, Jesus was not afraid when Judas was there. Satan entered into Judas right there in the Lord's that that last uh, supper of the Lord's uh, at the Lord's table. So you got to understand the audacity of the enemy to enter in any place he finds a open door. And it might not be the doors that you have opened up. It may be the doors that are inside the highly trained satanic warrior monk, or super soldier as they call themselves, that have plotted out. And uh, usually, listen, for some of you listening right now, you're going to be saying, yes, we realize this. Wow, man, now we're seeing it. Well, you know what? You may be a year behind the origins of their plotting to infiltrate your church, to compromise your prayer and your pastor, your leadership, and to bring division and curse and to weaken your church and to, and to literally tear it down. Some of them do it to see how, how their powers are being worked and operating. Some of them do it for many other reasons, which we're going to go into in a few moments. But let me tell you again. Matter of fact, let me read you something out of Galatians chapter 2, down in verse... Um, this is down uh, in, in the second part of verse 4. Galatians chapter 2 says this. Well, let me read the whole verse. The, uh, this matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on our freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. Hear it again. This matter arose because some false brothers, listen, False brothers had infiltrated our ranks. Infiltration has the idea that they're showing up. Uh, they're coming in uh, with a mask on. They're coming in with, with one agenda, an agenda that looks peaceful and nice, an agenda that seems that they identify with you. They're coming in. They're being a part of you. They're associating with you. But the truth is, uh, on the other side of that mask is an evil agenda. They have a plot. They have a plan uh, to bring harm. And let me tell you something, in this case of satanic super soldiers, the chosen ones, cult multiples, whatever you want to call them, they are in churches all across the United States. They have targeted for years. Some of them have been in your Sunday school classes. We have found some that have been preaching in, in a church. Let me tell you about one guy real quick. One guy... We sent a team of our shatter workers down to this meeting. There he was. He was playing the piano and singing Amazing Grace. The crowd was clapping, listening to him. He could do it very well. He uh, got up and preached for a while. Then he began to prophesy and lay hands on individuals and go around. And all the, all the folks there were clapping and applauding. And they thought he was a great charismatic uh, preacher and leader. And we, already been, we had been tracking him. We had six or seven victims of sexual abuse where he knew how to split and uh, program personality, and uh, he knew what he was doing with all these different victims. He went by the name, I won't say his entire name, but Dan was the, the man. He's dead now. Uh, he's dead now in, in, in the context, though, of some saying that he's had up to 200 victims. He infiltrated the church. He played a role by telling everybody he was there to help victims of cults and satanic you know, issues and um, he would take off. He would take some of these people away, and and uh, and and meet them later, and and program them more, and sexually abuse them, and do. I I, I can't even go into all the details about what this. Man. He was one of the most evil men we've ever met. He could he could look so happy and and so nice, and he could be praising God and and talking. You know the talk. Matter of fact, we played. Uh, we we did a little ops on him. We did a surveillance. We sent a surveillance team to uh, oversee him because a, a young boy was missing, and it was told to us by the father that this man had him. And so we had found out where he lived. We had come right to the backside of his house, and we called on a cell phone, and uh, we had other people in the area, and we contacted this Reverend Dan. And Reverend Dan got on the phone and talked with me. I told him who I was, and I said, Listen, uh, we are told that uh, this young man, this 17-year-old uh, boy, uh, you have him. 
And he's, oh, no, brother, man, uh, no, I'm a pastor too, and oh, we'll do anything to help, man, we'll be praying, and uh, God bless you, and we'll help you in every way. And he's talking all this jargon, and while he was doing it, the young man we were looking for walked out of a, a sliding glass door onto a porch to smoke a cigarette. He had the guy there with him. Later, we had another one of our guys contact Reverend Dan and meet him down at a restaurant. I was sitting by the very next chair over by myself drinking coffee and uh, they both came in and they sat down and uh, so his back was to me. And as he's talking with one of my workers, one of my fellow workers, he brings up my name and he says, oh, I know Russ Dizdar. Yeah, I've worked with Russ Dizdar in Akron before and he's, and he's talking about knowing me and uh, working with me to my own worker and I'm sitting behind him. He was a liar. He was a deceiver. He was an infiltrator. And his infiltration had purpose. And that was uh, corruption. That was uh, uh, sexual rape, uh, mental and emotional rape, and to unleash satanic harm in local churches. Finally, in the middle of the night, uh, I got a phone call, and someone told me to turn on the local Christian uh, television. And as I turned it on, sure enough, here's this man, Reverend Dan, telling testimony, all these things he came out of. I mean, he had the local Christian station completely duped. So we engaged the Christian station and told them all about this guy. They said, oh yeah, we had checks, we thought there was something wrong, everything else. Well, they, they of course canceled him from being on any longer. He was going to speak at a large convention uh, of, uh, of uh, a charismatic uh, women's conference. And uh, so we contacted them, and oh yeah, there was people that had questions about him, but he was going to be a major speaker there. But we had to engage and say and tell who he really was, because we found out the facts. And we had, you know, up at that time, we kept the victims continued to grow. We eventually ended up with eight of them ourselves. I'm telling you about those who have infiltrated the Christian church by plot, by plan, by design. And they're here to do us harm. You may be listening to this by providence right now. You may have gotten this on the internet. And, and you know you need to send it to a pastor, to a leader, to, a, to the head of the counseling center, to somebody within your organization. Because there's somebody there among the group that doesn't seem right. They've kind of come in out of nowhere, and all of a sudden they're right in the center of leadership, right in the middle of all the staff, and things are going wrong, and things are going weird, and you get a, a check in your heart about this person. And the weirdest thing is that I'm telling you this, that they are the most sophisticated infiltrators uh, in history. They have tremendous abilities, my friend. Don't just sit back and say, well, God's going to protect us. Of course He's going to protect us. Don't you remember the seven churches of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, uh, 3, and uh, th in those two chapters, we have the Lord Jesus confronting churches like Thyatira and, and Sardis and Laodicea. You know what he said to one church? That he's, uh, that he's got problems with them because they're tolerating a woman named Jezebel. She was a satanic worshiper. She was uh, in the church and she was misleading servants, actual Christians. She was misleading them through cultic teaching and perverse sexual um, uh, ritual and, and performances that she'd mingled, usually uh, left-hand path occultism always has a perversion of sexuality with it, because that involves dirtying the, the soul anyway. And so the seven churches also had the Nicolaitans. And uh, Jesus was dealing with those seven churches, and he commended one church for hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Because the Nicolaitans, they had no problem like the early Gnostics. They may have been somewhat the early Gnostics. And they were, uh, had no problem uh, you know, coming in with a different Jesus and, and infiltrating churches and trying to teach a different thing and, and draw disciples out of those local churches and do a lot of harm. You know, we've read in Scripture, again, don't let anyone deceive you. We've read in First John, I'm writing this to you so that no one, uh, because of those who are trying to lead you astray, we're told again and again about the seduction of the church. Satan has no trouble infiltrating. If he can't find a hole in your life, in the, in the leadership of your church, then he may operate in and through those who are trained in the Luciferian system, the ancient brotherhood. And they're committed to this task because they have a long-range plan. And I'll get to that in a few moments too, but what I want to share right now is, is again, some of the stories. 
Let me tell you about one of the, again, a cult multiple, a person who had multiple personality disorder. The, the personalities inside were created from childhood on by design. Personalities were programmed to be priestesses, assassins, hunters, all kinds of different uh, jobs that they had. They were, of course, demonized, and there was cult loyal and, and runners and informers and everything else. Well, this dear person that we were ministering to, as we began to really do ministry to and do deliverance, they did begin to tell us, and inside uh, personalities began to tell us and share with us about some of the things that they had done. Matter of fact, I interviewed this person on how they do infiltration. And this person was telling us, you know, they would say, Russ, Pastor Russ, you don't realize how easy it is to infiltrate the way we're doing right now. We can come in among churches, we can raise our hands and say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Of course, we don't mean the Lord Jesus Christ, we mean the Lord Satan. We come inside your churches and we lay our hands on people and where you have unchecked tongue speaking going on, where the, 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 the gift of tongues in charismatic and Pentecostal circles is being operated uh, without any interpretation, where you're allowing you know, to, it to go freely and whatever, we infiltrate and uh, we also speak in tongues, but as we lay hands on people and speak in tongues, they're satanic tongues given by demonic spirits and they're transferring curses and they're transferring other uh, satanic um, confusion and uh, warfare. Well, she went on to tell me about some of the infiltration. She talked about her and a part of her team that we engaged that also infiltrated the Jimmy Swagger organization. And she named another other place, a couple other nationally known places. It is my personal belief right now concerning the John Todd tapes and John Wesley White and what happened uh, with the Bakers and PTL involved involved not only the sin of individuals. Uh, who did not guard themselves, but it involved a planned and plotted out attack uh, with these satanic super soldiers, a woman who would bring seduction and, and seduce. I don't think most of us realize that on the outside they can seem to be one thing, but on the inside are the personalities that are co-conscious, that are there prepared. They're doing warfare against you. They're doing warfare against your families. They wouldn't, they wouldn't hesitate if they switched and came forward to abuse a child in your church, to harm anyone else, to do curses and rituals against pastors and leaders, to do things right in the service. Well, we're going to tell you a few things more. This one individual told us about their infiltration of, of a number of places and how they did it. We knew of another individual that in, infiltrated. Uh, I mean, they were there for help, but they didn't get all the help. They didn't get completely delivered and completely uh, healed on the inside. They had cult, uh, that means uh, coven loyal, Luciferian loyal personalities inside still left. And... Uh, once again, we saw them as they infiltrated, got to the very top of leadership, got into the offices, preoccupied the time of the leader there, and, uh, and uh, got involved with children's ministry. They did the same thing at a local church. Um, and uh, it's, it's very covert and very stealth on their part. Let me tell you about another person. We have been doing radio programs for the last year across the nation with a number of different radio stations and uh, internet and local radio stations and all of a sudden an individual from Texas contacts me and, and acts like a, a believer somewhat and, and is discussing with me and telling me and, and talking and, 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 and not too many of the audience has you know, contacted me to, and said let me call you, I want to talk to you direct. And uh, so we had let that occur, and there was a check in my spirit concerning this person. And we, we did this again and again, and, and we interacted with emails, and they wanted to send gifts. What I began to find out was that this individual, who I thought was a cult multiple, who was operating that way, uh, was doing the same thing with almost every single radio station that I had already engaged that I was uh, doing interviews with, they began to contact the leaders of those radio stations, those internet groups, and email them, and uh, they began to do the very same thing. So we had uh, done as we've done before. We had prayed it up and waited, and there was a certain day this person wanted to call again and engage, and they engaged in prayer over the telephone, and we engaged, and personalities came up. As I began to pray concerning the demonized uh, personalities on the inside and the demonization that was there and the wicked plot that was going on, there were certain uh, cult-loyal personalities 
uh, demon worshipping personalities that came forward to engage me and to cuss at me and so forth. And this battle went on for a while, and uh, and I and I and I poured out uh, the goal of bringing you know again Jesus and deliverance and healing. And this person eventually withdrew and had to get off the phone. What they didn't know was the entire conversation and the entire deliverance and freedom encounter was taped. And they tried to contact other people. And uh, they got outed. They got found out. People began to prayer target this, this individual and maybe a group that this person is with. And uh, nobody has heard from this person any longer. That's how they operate. They show up for a while, they seek to do damage, and then they will disappear. Then they'll be gone while all uh, everybody's fighting and all the different trouble is going on within an organization, within a ministry, within a life. And it takes a while to begin to track backwards to these uh, highly trained and very sophisticated satanic warrior monks. These chosen ones, cult multiples, that are in and among our churches. And so I've been training on this for the last 10 years and telling people this is the first public message we're doing. Materials are being written and uh, will be published at a particular date. And we will do all that we can to warn the body of Christ. It's not that God does not have power and grace and might. I mean, that's what's occurring right now. God has shown us. When Satan comes in like a flood, God can raise up standards. And, and many of you that are listening right now need to be that standard bearer. You need to understand how they operate and what they're doing. Some of you who are counselors uh, to those who have MPD, SRA, DID, whatever you want to call it, I'm telling you that half of those that we've ever dealt with over 20-some years uh, don't want out. The inside core will and core personalities uh, are committed to the Luciferian side, and they don't want out. They'll allow you to deal with the upper personalities. They will allow you to deal with the upper uh, you know, victim personalities. They'll even present victimization. All the while, on the inside, and prior to them ever meeting you, they've already targeted you, targeted your ministry, they've already plotted it, they've got probably a covering team from behind doing uh, satanic ritual against you, along with this infiltration, and it's all to bring about particular effect and to draw you away. Listen, it can be very dangerous too. I was in the home of a federal officer's house in Cleveland, towards the Cleveland area of Ohio. We had dealt with his wife for some years out of a group she called the Circle of Dominion. She had numerous personalities inside, spoke German fluently. Uh, her mother was from Germany, and she was connected to the Black Flame and the old SS soldiers. As we dealt with this woman concerning it one day, and we, we you know, she really, in, in the beginning days, outwitted us many times, highly trained, until we began to do surveillance and pray and see the providence of God unveil her and catch her numerous times in her plots. So one day, when the coven was supposed to take her and steal her, uh, we were invited to come to the house. Now listen, in this house, there were men all around with weapons to protect this, this woman. And uh, phone calls were coming in to try to trigger her to, for another personality to come forward and to, and to dart and run out of the house and run to the coven. While we were in the house, this individual um, was looking at me very pitifully. Then all of a sudden, their face the switch occurred. The stern, strong-looking face, eyes uh, that, that looked glazed over and black and cold as steel. They said they needed to talk to me in the other room. As we walked into the other room, this person probably weighed a hundred pounds, this lady. And as I stood there before her, there was a sense of warning inside by the Spirit of God. I had my arms crossed over my chest looking at her, talking, and this personality named uh, Iris began to talk to me and uh, wanted to get closer and closer and closer and I backed her up twice she said what's wrong don't you uh, are you afraid of a little woman she asked me twice to put my arms down to my sides instead of across my chest she had her arms across her uh, midsection also as I looked at her and began to put my arms down, the Spirit of God said, She's going to stab you. I mean, in an instant, God spoke to me. And at that exact moment, she pulled out a, a needle that must have been six inches long from the sash around her waist and attempted to jab me in the center part of my chest. 
Of course, we blocked her, and her arms pushed her back to a couch. She, that personality, grabbed the needle, ran into the kitchen to throw it down the garbage disposal and try to destroy it. Her husband ran in. Everybody grabbed a hold of her. It ended up in a, a demonic manifestation where we prayed and broke the demonic presence. The coven sent her in. At that point in the game, in that point of the uh, game they were playing with us, with the husband, and in their infiltration, she was sitting there to literally stab me. Pitifully sad, victim-looking, one second. But when the switch occurs and the other personality, demonized, trained personality comes forward, it is a whole new ball game. For some of you, you may be licking your wounds. You may begin to understand. Maybe you've been defeated by this. I have seen even staff members and others defeated by this. I have watched and heard and counseled and driven to other states to deal with churches and pastors and leaders and uh, groups that have gone through this issue of infiltration into their churches in, in these days that we're living in. So I want to try to help you a little bit today, and maybe um, you can. Maybe again, you say, "Well, I'm not even sure I believe all this stuff." Put it in the back of your mind and heart, and you know, just keep it there because I'm telling you right now. Here's my own human. This is a human prediction that there are going to be. Um, if you're in a good church, you're going to have infiltration happen there. You're going to have them all around. Please understand that there are over four million diagnosed cases. Probably another four to five million uh, cult multiples out there. Somebody trained them. Somebody began to gear them up in the late 50s and through the 60s and early 70s. And they've assigned them. Yes, we've seen many victims. Yes, we've seen some healed completely and totally delivered, healed, and that love the Lord Jesus Christ and are, are completely freed. And now they're telling the same story again and again and again, how they were trained, what they, why they were trained, what they were doing, and how they operate. Maybe you're somebody like that, and you don't realize that God now can use you to counter some of this. God can use the information you have to counter some of the things that are going on. And you've got to be brave enough and strong enough to step forward and say, Lord Jesus, you've loved me, you've delivered me, and uh, you've freed me, and you're healing my life completely. And here I am to tell everything I can, to tell everything I can, and do all that I can to stop this, to completely stop this. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, um, some of the reasons why they, they, they infiltrate. This comes from what we've observed, uh, what we've interacted with, what we've battled, and their direct information. Let me give you ten things directly. Number one, for reconnaissance. Number one, for reconnaissance. They are coming in to do reconnaissance. Uh, they're grid mapping. They're, they're observing you and the pastor, the spiritual nature of the church, what kind of prayer goes on, how much power is displayed, if you're a real threat to the satanic system, the Luciferian system, if you need to be marked down, if you need to be filed, you know, uh, put a file done on you to let the rest of the group know for the future, um, and uh, whether you're dangerous spiritually uh, to uh, them and their, their kind, uh, to the Luciferian or satanic system. So reconnaissance. They're going to look for information. They're going to take bulletins and materials. They're going to ask a lot of questions. They're going to get, get everything they can. They're going to ask questions about your passion, about the leaders and others. They're going to get all the information they can to gather. They're going to take things back in that reconnaissance to use in ritual format, to do rituals against you as points uh, uh, of objects uh, of, of yours. They'll take them out of your bathroom. They'll take them out of your office. They'll take them out of your church. And if you've let them in, their, in your home, they will take them from your home. And they will also uh, uh, take those objects and uh, use those objects wherever they possibly can. Let me tell you number two. It's all about spiritual attack. When they come in among you and they're doing reconnaissance and they're acting like a new person or maybe a victim or they're there for counseling or whatever else, uh, they're there for spiritual attack. Uh, while they might present themselves in one way, on the inside of them, they've been, you got to understand how this technology, this demonic technology operates. They have uh, co conscious personalities on the inside that are demonized, that are down, that are on the inside. They may even be able to look out through the eyes. When you look at them, you might even think their eyes are strange. It seems like two people are looking out through their eyeballs right at you. 
um, you'll get that particular stare. If you get checks about people like that, look into their eyes. Do it with uh, the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to discern and penetrate. And they're going to be, um, on the one hand, being friendly to you. Uh, they, the, Mingala did this. It's called doubling. And uh, they're presenting themselves in one fashion. They can be even sitting in a chair asking for your prayers and sympathy and telling you uh, terrible stories of abuse and things that went on, and you're sympathizing, and they're counting on you lowering your guard so that other personalities on the inside can be doing warfare against you. If you find that you're getting headaches, you're getting sick, you're getting confused, you're having to shut down your counseling uh, a session a little bit early and send them away if you're fi feeling fatigued and everything else, if you're having dreams and things going on and your health is going down, then it's very, very possible that they've been doing warfare against you and uh, they have been... They have been uh, doing it in a covert manner. Number three, they've come to attack leadership and prayer particularly. They're going to go after your pastor. They're going to go after leaders. They're going to go after the head of your organization. They're going to do that. They want to get close to them. They want to do that so that they can bring a harm, strike the shepherd, scatter the sheep principle. They understand that. They want to be able to get involved in your prayer stuff and, and somehow switch it or change it or in the middle of your prayer and they come in as a fake intercessor while you're praying and doing things. They're inwardly praying against all the things you're praying and you're finding disruption but you don't know where it's coming from. This again is you're finding that there's, maybe you know there's spiritual warfare going on but you don't know where it's coming from. Listen, if there's nobody around you that has opened up doorways and it's either coming through ritual format from some coven out there, they've opened the doors, or an individual that is carrying um, personalities on the inside of them that can do sp demonic warfare and ritual against you. Number four, uh, they're there to create division. They're there to create division in your church. I mean, you're going to find them going in. They want to be counseled by six, seven different people. They'll go from counselor to counselor to counselor. They'll go to individual people. They'll begin to say, you know, whisper things against this person over here, whisper things against that person over there. This person told me this. This person told me that. They'll do con phone call conversations. But they're doing it um, by design. They're doing it as a method to get people to begin to re think, hey, this person's lied about me. This person spoke this against me. They said this. She said this. She'll have you in all kinds of, they will have you in all kinds of uh, disruptive uh, you know, uh, meetings and uh, uh, meetings that involve uh, you know, clarifying things and everything becomes confusing. They're there to create division among you. Point five, they're there to compromise you. They're there to compromise the leader. Listen, they have personalities in them that have been trained for sex with demonic presence uh, that, are, that are, if you want to say that the demonic is operating in the area of lust and so forth. They're there to project that lust, to project sensuality. Uh, they may all of a sudden a personality come forward in a woman that's being counseled that begins to talk about uh, their need and and uh, and they've, they've been doing warfare against the pastor and confusion and things have been coming and sooner or later, like we know here again in the greater Akron area, I was a student at Malone College and I heard about a pastor, a really great pastor that I knew and uh, he was counseling a multiple. Um, back in the early days we didn't know a whole lot. And he was counseling in the early 80s, and he was doing deliverance. And he, he made the mistake of thinking everything was demons. And he had no idea uh, of the kind of uh, inside trained personalities that were there, too. And eventually this uh, also involved uh, falling into sexual sin, stumbling into uh, seeing another leader fall into it. And this entire church was just completely, uh, completely compromised. The pastor was compromised. And, uh, and and demons even spoke out of this uh, girl that was being delivered and said they were going to bring this compromise. They didn't have any idea how it was going to operate, though. They didn't realize that it would come from within them. And so they're there to compromise. Pastors and leaders and others, you've got to make it a, a, a clear rule that you're just never, never, ever... I mean, they're going to do this. We've had this happen many times where they want to call and they've got a need going on or, or a crisis. Please come and meet me. They're going to want to talk to you privately. Yes, I want to talk to you privately. I need to talk to you where nobody else is around so that they can begin the plot of compromise as, as they are satanically praying uh, for you to fall. 
Let me give you number six. They want to get involved in your church in such a way that they'll, they'll even say, man, I'll clean the church, I'll mop the floors, I'll do anything. Or they get involved in any kind of leadership or get involved anywhere along the way and, and somehow, somewhere along, you, you come to, to the point of trusting them. They want that. They want to be able to get a hold of the keys of the church. You know why? So that they can plot in advance so that when nobody's around, they have the keys and three, you know, 12 midnight on a Saturday night, they're there, dropped off, other Satanists are dropped off, and uh, they have the keys to get in your church, and they're going to do rituals right inside your church, right inside the sanctuary, to dirty the atmosphere, to do curses against the church, and to do all that they can. They're going to leave by 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, the church will show up the next morning and sense something is wrong, but you can't figure it out. It's because we we have not taken spiritual warfare seriously for such a long time Christians we're we're really behind on on what's what's happening with this whole subject of spiritual warfare and all that's going on and i'm going to tell you they're going to use the building and they're going to get inside and they're going to do ritual stuff and this has happened in a large church in an area where they use the uh, library and other places um, they want to do that to desecrate They want to do it to desecrate. Let me tell you number seven. They want to be involved in your children's and youth ministries. They want to be involved in those ministries because inside personalities who've been trained to sexually molest children uh, can, can, can... switch out in, 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 in just a few moments, taking the children down the hallway to a restroom. In just a few moments, they can, they can sexually abuse a child. We had a local church here. It's high profile, very large church. Came in, it was in the, in, in the newspapers where one of their interns got caught molesting a child. That individual showed up in our offices. Part of the team of Shadow of the Darkness began to pray with them, and, uh, and he manifested demonic presence, and, and he was completely demonized. In that local church, you've got to understand the infiltration principles, my friend. You've got to understand this. They're going to go after your youth. We had one individual, uh, like I mentioned, the one that had war on the... Now, she wore a, a wristband where you couldn't see war on the saints, uh, tattooed into her left wrist. But when she was going to that church and acting like she was in need, and she went forward to join the church and everything, but she confessed later that she went to the youth meetings and she was to draw young people and she was to compromise them in sexual things and to draw them out. And the, the ultimate goal was to try to get one of the members to get so far away from Christ so as to join the coven. She would gain rank in her coven by doing that. Let me go to point eight. The eighth thing is this. All the information and things that they're doing within your church and everything is being shared with a coven group somewhere. Somewhere back there they're doing it. They're sharing the materials. And then that coven group uh, may send somebody in to be a visitor in the church to observe. Man, they're having a heyday. They're loving it. They're, they're feeling elitist and superior. And they're looking you over and laughing at you guys. And uh, they're laughing at your ministry and... And they're observing and they're calculating, you know, what level they brought you down and when they're going to do the big, big thing and pounce on you. Their coven may be doing blitzkrieg warfare, lightning warfare, uh, ritual warfare, rituals, blood rituals. They may be marking, putting sigils and, and symbols in the church. They may be putting objects that are demonized and giving you gifts. We'll talk about this on part two. But they have definitely, if you've got somebody this like this that I'm talking about in your church, then the inside personalities, uh, they are informing, they are calling, if not meeting with, the coven members to let them know what's going on. And the coven members will then continue to do the warfare, to bring sickness and, and uh, bring division, and, and to continue to bring destruction. And they love to do this covertly. They want to do it as a hidden thing. They want to know that they're striking you and hitting you. Just like Satan did Job in the book of Job. Job didn't know what was hitting him until the very end of the book. And all those things were occurring because of the satanic um, you know, warfare that was coming against him. Well, now, as Satanists have learned this over the years, they've learned how to just literally carry the demons into your church into their, from their sub-personalities. 
and to plot and to plan. Uh, they've been taught well by the demons, and uh, they've been taught well by the inspiration of demonic presence to bring compromise to you. Well, let me tell you again, uh, the ninth uh, point in all of this, the reasons they're infiltrating, is uh, that they're, they're, they're seeking out other victims. They're looking to see if you have anybody else there that are victims and, and uh, they want to be able to go after them and draw them out and, and uh, spy on them and tell on them and, and inform on them and eventually draw them back. And then tenthly, many of them there are there as sleepers. They're there as sleepers. Because they have a day, my friend, that they call the Black Awakening. Thousands and thousands of churches have cult multiples in them, sitting there, some of them quietly, waiting, until the inside personalities are activated, joined together, and uh, the programmed, demonized personalities uh, will come forth, and uh, they will attack a local church. And I'm talking about killing, destroying, hurting, doing all kinds of things. We'll talk more about this. Uh, we talk more about this in our in our... Uh, broadcasts on the Black Awakening. But those are ten of the reasons why they're infiltrating. And you need to look them over and think them over and uh, see what's happening in your local ministry. Hey, this is Russ Dizdar, part one uh, of a two-part series on the infiltration of the Christian church by satanic super soldiers and your ministries. Hey, listen, I'm praying for you. God bless you. Engage. Listen, please listen to part two so you know what to do, how to uh, counter this, and what kind of believers we need to be in these days. Check out the organization Shatter the Darkness, www.shatterthedarkness.net, and God bless you. Hi, this is Russ again. This is part two of the series on the infiltration of the Christian church. Let me go over just a few things on uh, point, on the first part. I want to just uh, remind you again uh, why they do infiltrate the church, uh, along with other areas, but uh, the church specifically. Number one, reconnaissance. Number two, spiritual attack. Number three, attacking leadership and the prayer structure of a church. Four, creating division. Five, uh, seeking compromise, uh, the compromise of leaders and folks in the church. Six, they get in uh, to the point to where they can uh, begin to use the building and um, use it at nighttime for rituals, things like that, if they can get a hold of the keys by becoming the janitor or anything else inside the, the, the body there. Number seven, they'll go after youth and children. Um, and uh, you got to be very careful in this area because there can be uh, sexual abuse or harm done if you give them uh, opportunity. Eight was um, they'll join their coven in warfare against the local church and um, give all the information to that local coven. Nine was they will uh, seek out other victims that a church might be seeking to help, those who are MPD, SRA, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> nine um, was... If you begin to see, um, for example, sicknesses, uh, headaches, your time is consumed, things like that, the issue of just wanting to consume your time and, um, you know, create, uh, I mean, problems even on a physical level for you. And then 10, they're there as sleepers. Many of them there are intact. Um, they've got, we've found in numerous churches where there's cult multiples or these chosen ones. Um, where they're actually teaching uh, Sunday school class or involved in some area of ministry. They can do this because that's what the multiplicity is all about. And that's what I want to touch on before I go into the other part of this. Um, you know, how, how it is they get in and how do we respond. Let me just touch on this, who they are. Uh, who they are is in one sense they're victims because this began before they were born. Uh, they were born through... Um, being chosen uh, through transgenerational bloodlines. 
they were chosen in the sense that uh, they believed the people who uh, caused the conception, uh, they, they would have done pre-conception uh, rituals during the time of the child in the womb, and afterwards, this child was already chosen to be, in our view, a victim of uh, this multiplicity, the satanic uh, agenda that they would have in raising them. This is all about, um, in a lighter way, you go back to the Nazis and, and Himmler and Hitler's uh, view of creating a master race. This continued in the 50s, but it went worldwide. And uh, again, it's going to take me over three hours just to go into that discussion I'm just trying to give a quick Reader's Digest view of who they are. They are human beings who have been taken, selected in a satanic agenda, uh, a demonic technology that has been found. You can say science and, and, and demonism uh, joined together in how to split the human soul, how to take the human personality and literally split it off and create alter or sub-personalities, program those personalities demonize those personalities and then bury them down in a system they will have triggers and codes to call each one up for example a personality inside may be used as a sex slave one might be used in uh, as a ritual priestess one may be used as a runner one is there to find information one is there to be an assassin or a murderer one is there to uh, learn the ancient languages Almost in every case of what is called a satanic chosen one, you'll find somebody in there that can um, speak fluent German. And uh, there's a reason, again, because many of their trainers um, were, were Nazis and carried on the agenda to create an, an Aryan, a pure bloodline, a god-man, a almost Nephilim-type uh, human being. They've transmuted humans. And we need to take a look at this because since in the 70s, there were just a few cases showing up at uh, psychological you know, wards and offices and so forth. In the 80s, thousands and thousands showed up. In the 90s, uh, literally into the millions. And this is an amazing um, thing that has occurred. And my, my biggest issue is why, since we know that m most all of it is the purposeful creation of multiple or sub personalities, why nobody's asking who's done all this and tracking that? Well, that's part of what we do. We wanted to go after who's who's done it, tracking them, and uh, that's a continual thing. And we have another again seminar information we we put out. It'll take two or three hours to go over all that. But they are those who are called we call them handlers, or some of the chosen ones know what handlers and watchers or enforcers are are all about. Also. But who they are are those who've been given over to Satan, the people that, that, that raised them, believe that they'd be a part of a pure bloodline, uh, again, Luciferian in, in doctrine and belief, that uh, will help rid the world eventually of Christendom and the Jews. Uh, they will be used in the Black Awakening, the great chaos to come. They'll be used in the, uh, the, in, the enthronement of the Antichrist. Uh, many of the chosen ones that we've dealt with when we've gotten down to core issues inside of them and personalities that were trained to be um, part of the Black Awakening, they uh, all have all confessed, especially the German-speaking ones, that they are part of the troops of Antichrist, that they're here um, and that they are here to do harm. So it's very important that uh, you, you can get a number of books. Go to our website, shatterthedarkness.net, and if you click on areas, uh, you're going to see a lot of different books, materials. There's a lot of books in the secular field uh, that you can read about and, and look into. Um, I feel that out of probably 100 of them, you know, there's, they're not going far enough in, in descriptions of uh, the origins and the purposes and reasons. That's why we have a book coming out called The Black Awakening, which will describe uh, a lot more detail and the spiritual nature of the creation of chosen ones. Now, these are human beings who've been put through, purposely put through, many, many rituals. They've been put through pain and harm, and so they may have within them a number of personalities that some call home-created personalities. Through pain and torture and horror, they uh, have split off only to protect their, their personality as a whole, to be able to have the new sub-personality take in all the pain, torture, and whatever else is done to them. 
Each of the personalities hold their own memory. So most of the time when you're dealing with a victim of SRA, MPD, DID, whatever you want to call it, they, uh, the front person and a few of the personalities you may get to talk to may have very limited knowledge. And they're meant to be amnesic. The difficulty is, is that in the beginning stages of where the internal system of cult loyal and highly trained and demonized personalities, they will permit upfront personalities to engage, to talk, to go to church, whatever else, as long as they can stay buried and hidden and fulfill their agenda. Now, when you talk with them and things like that, that's why I'm saying that many times when you're helping victims, um, in some cases, that the whole thing is a setup. The whole thing is a setup to where you're going to be drawn into vulnerability. Uh, you're going to be, you know, drawn into a number of uh, time-consuming uh, engagements with the in individual. All the while, the inside. Uh, sub-personalities, cult loyal, demonized, uh, Luciferian oriented personalities, they'll be doing all of what we talked about in part one, getting the reconnaissance and all those kind of things. Um, they'll also be doing warfare against you, you know, kind of basically making a file on you and assessing you. They will spiritually read you. They will look for holes in your life. They will look for uh, anything they can do to bring uh, corruptness to you, anything they can do in their rituals to target in your life, to harm you. They will do that. The inside personalities will do that. Maybe the upfront person wouldn't do that, but the inside personalities, you better believe it, they will do that. And it's very important that you and I understand that. Uh, that's how this works. Well, what I want to do right now is go on to um, how, how it is they get in so close to everybody. I mean, we have found them so close to everybody. I mean, we have found them in all kinds of places. We found them as law enforcement agents. We have found them. Um, we found one married to a federal officer. We found one that was uh, working as a contract agent for the feds. And the the scary thing is, is that we've seen at this point where they they have been literally placed. Please understand this issue, and I, I can't go into a lot of it right now. But many of the early ones, there was a project they called some disputed it, but uh, they called it Monarch. And the idea of monarch is, is that it's the only creature that has been that has migrated every continent on the earth. The mentality behind the the hundreds of thousands and even millions of these who have been trained and chosen and so forth uh, of multiple multiples like this is that they have, uh, in their view, the Luciferian or Brotherhood view, that they have uh, literally been placed in every a continent of the world, let alone. They have been placed uh, in churches, um, in um, in every kind of place, military, and that's all in the discussion of the Black Awakening. And the reason I can't do that here again, it just takes too long to go over that. But I want to go over not only why they do it, as we already mentioned again and gave you a recap of Part One. Um, and if you haven't listened to Part One, it's very important you do. But here is Part Two, and I'm going to go over about eight uh, principles how they get in so close. Whether it's law enforcement, military, anywhere else, uh, there is this sense, this Judas project sense. Judas got in very close. Judas was one who didn't believe in the beginning, and he was right there with Jesus. He was there in the Lord's table. He was there among them. I mean, he was living there among them. Yet he had a completely different heart about him. Now, he wasn't a multiple. He wasn't what I'm talking about. I'm just simply saying that it's, that it's possible. In every local church, and I've been a pastor for you know, 30 years in ministry and, and in the body of Christ, listen, a local church has uh, people who are real Christians and members and they're strong. They have uh, Christians who are struggling and maybe even backslidden. They have people who are brand new Christians. They have visitors there. They have cultural Christians. What I mean by that is... Um, They've been raised in the church. They're not really born again. They don't know God yet, but they know all the uh, religious forms and format, and they can be in a local church. Um, so you've got a, a tremendous mix in a local church as it opens its door to everybody, but it's different when you have somebody being placed in there with an agenda uh, to, to spy you out, to do harm, to um, give information back, to 
keep uh, your church, your pastor, uh, on a grid map. And uh, we had one uh, individual chosen one come out of the PA area and, and discussed with us about how every uh, church in Northeast Ohio is on a grid map, and they're color-coded. And the ones in certain colors are the troubled churches, the ones that would give them trouble. And so they begin to do you know, rituals and satanic ritual level warfare against those churches. They do ritual warfare in the sense that they like to dirty the air in, in a region. And they also then send people to those churches, um, like we're talking about, to infiltrate and um, to be to eventually do harm. Do they come in that way? Do they walk in the front door with a red suit on little horns on their head and a, and a, and a, and a tail? <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, they don't come in that way. They usually come in as uh, victims or those who are very needy. Um, they can come in, and I'll mention this to you right now, and we'll, we'll talk about this more later. They can also come in as somebody that seems like they're very committed as a believer. Uh, they can teach Sunday school. They can be in worship uh, team. They can sing. They can, they can do some things. I mean, we found high-level cult multiples who, could, who are teaching Sunday school class, who are involved in counseling ministry, all kinds of things like that. And maybe the upfront person is amnesic. The inside personalities, the ones that are in charge, um, that's how it's all been created by the programmers and splitters and handlers. And the upfront person may know nothing other than they're there to help and be helpful, and you can't really read them too much, because on the inside, the ones that are hidden, uh, they're there with a different agenda. They Sometimes they could be co-conscious. They could be looking out and listening. Listen. Just assume that every single multiple you meet, no matter how needy, no matter what victim level they come in, come in as, just assume that they're a highly sophisticated, dedicated, powerful um, per sub-personalities that are listening to you, that are reading you, that are gathering information, and that are doing all the things I talked about in part one. Assume that because over 20 years of our experience, and in the early days, man, they ran circles around us. Uh, we had to really, you know, wage, you know, wade through a lot of things to uh, figure out how they are operating, um, and it put us in danger at times. But we learned how to um, counter infiltrate. We learned how to, you know, follow um, and do surveillance and many other things that I won't talk about on this tape. Let me talk to you about how they get in so close in churches. And my concern is this. The churches that I visit sometimes, churches that I speak in and do conferences at, that I see them. I see them there, and the leadership doesn't even know. They just know that, hey, this is our great friend. This is our little uh, sister that we love. This is, our, this is somebody who just, oh, this, you know, we're here to guard them and protect them. And that means that their vulnerability, the door to vulnerability, and uh, their sense of discernment uh, is really lost because they've taken on the caregiver aspect so deeply that they can't get to uh, even believing that that same individual, if they switched, an inside cult-level personality would slice their throat, would give them poison, would uh, do rituals, and, and, and would um, sexually abuse children in the nursery. I guarantee you that's how it works. All I can tell you is that I plead with you to understand this principle uh, because I have shown over all these years I've loved them and helped them and blessed them and prayed for them and watched them. Let me tell you really quick here. In the beginning days when, I, when we did not know as much as we do now, uh, we let them come to the house that we were renting. Uh, we let a federal officer's wife come to our house who was a multiple, a cult multiple, who had personalities that could speak German, that had... Um, but in the beginning, she was just simply a victim. She was so pitiful, so sad, so, uh, you know, you wanted just to help her in every single way. But we let her come to our house, and uh, we found out later that uh, other personalities, when she'd go up to the restroom, other places, they, were, they stole pictures of us, or they took hair out of the bathroom comb, or they took other objects of the house, only to take it back to the coven so they can have those objects to do rituals, use them in rituals against us. Let me tell you about another uh, thing that occurred, and uh, this if this doesn't uh, you know, rock your world, I don't really know what will. We had Berea Youth for Christ call us. I once worked uh, for 15 years with the organization Youth for Christ with young people, but 
uh, after I'd left and been away for a while, some of them still knew what I was into as far as this Shadow the Darkness organization. We uh, had them bring this girl down who they said was a victim of satanic ritual abuse. Uh, we met, first of all, in the Medina area off the expressway at a Bob Evans. Uh, she wore sunglasses. We sat there. I already knew enough to know that the moment I saw her, looked at her eyes, got the discernment on her, read her spiritually from the Holy Spirit perspective, that she was a multiple. And uh, that I got the sense already that she was playing games with uh, these guys. And they've never dealt with a, a ritually abused multiple, a highly trained one. She came in, I think it was in the area of July during St. James rituals. Uh, they had a number of people coming into the region, the area, doing rituals. Tr literally, they were doing seminars and training on how to do you know, all this stuff, training more of their people. <laughs> they do it. And um, this girl uh, we invited said she had a, she kept on telling them she has a demon, and she told us about this. Well, we had so many interactions, I'd love to tell you all the, the stories. But let me tell you one of those. She came, we brought her to our house also, to my office area of the house, and then all the guys from Berea came down, and uh, we had probably 10 or 12 people in the room, and we're going to pray with her, because she kept telling everybody, you know, I've got a demon named Python, and when Python comes up, I've been to church after church, I've been to Pentecostal churches, this church, that church, whenever I get among those churches and Python comes out, they'll spend 10 hours, you know, anointing me and praying over the demon, and, and they can't get Python to leave. And uh, Python uh, mocks them and, and everything else. Python's a powerful demon, and this person went on and on about Python. So finally I said, well, let's bring Python up. Come on, let's, let's get to it. And so, um, and again, because of our experience of this happening with another one, the moment, and I already sensed it, I already sensed it, but the moment we prayed and said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we called Python to come forward, uh, the girl switched, you know, you could tell she went from herself, all of a sudden this grovelly voice, hello, I am Python, you know, comes up and uh, begins to, I am Python, you will not defeat me, and uh, I felt the presence, I looked and sensed, and everybody began to pray, and I looked right at this person, and this personality looked at me, and I said, Python, you're not a demon, you're a human personality. And they looked at me like a deer that had been caught in headlights. And I, they looked at, back at me and they said, yes, I am a demon, I'm a demon. Ah. And I said, no, you're not a demon. They said, yes, I am. And I said, no, you're not. And they said, yes, I am. And I said, no, you're not a demon. And I said, yes, I am. And I said, well, prove it. Do something. Talk backwards. Do something supernatural. Do whatever. I'm a demon. I said, no, you're not. And then they said, I'm not? I said, no, you're, you're a human subpersonality that they've created. And then Python, once that deception was broken, confessed that the coven individuals or whoever the handlers were created them to act like and be a fake demon. And uh, this, what, what they do is they go to churches that uh, you know, would believe all the stuff is demonic and, and they would wear the church people out. They would go to ministry after ministry and wear them out hour after hour after hour and say, oh, you never got him out. He's still there. Python's still there. What's wrong with you people? It wasn't a demon. It was a human personality. And, and, and uh, the believer in Christ, your authority, the authority, spiritual authority Jesus gave in Luke chapter uh, 10, verse 17, 18, is not meant for human personality. You will not cast out subhuman personalities using spiritual authority. They need inner healing. They need to have the truth. They need to have, be penetrated by the Spirit of God and be brought inner healing so that they can be healed and, um, and Jesus can, uh, can take them. So it's very important that you understand, this same person, in the, after we did all this kind of stuff, they were kind of angry that they got outed and found out uh, they said they had to go to the bathroom. So I had two of our girls walk with her up to the restroom. Well, when they did this, my daughter had come from her room where she was playing when somebody else was watching her. Uh, she came out of the room down the hallway just as this multiple was passing by with two other ladies. The multiple stopped, you know, five feet from my daughter, looked at her, and a sub-personality, she switched, and another personality came forward, looked at my daughter, and in an evil, satanic, male voice said, I would love to take you and eat you. And the two girls, of course, ushered the multiple away from my daughter, and that was probably the last time I've ever permitted um, this kind of counseling in the homes that we've lived in. And that's probably been... 
uh, goodness, uh, 10, 12 years ago that that occurred. Um, this person also was found out that when the people, the Berea, Berea Youth for Christ individuals, took this victim in and helped her out and everything else, they found out. I said, listen, go check your phone bills. Go look in your house to see if her items stole. Sure enough, in her duffel bag, she had stolen items. I mean, this is a family that was Christian. They wanted to, you know, listen, satanic chosen ones count on your compassion. They count on it. They see it as a vulnerability to where when you're compassionate and vulnerable um, to them in a sense of caring for them and letting them in your house and whatever else, you know, again, inside personalities have a different agenda. They will steal from you. They will use the phone and call all over the place to tell their handlers where they're at what's going on uh, sure enough there were phone calls all over the place uh, that they had no knowledge of long distance calls that this individual did she had stuff that she had stolen out of their house in her duffel bag uh, all kinds of things I can go into the story more and more that story doesn't end with her uh, at that point but um, all I'm saying to you right now is, is that the way they get in the way they get into ministries, counseling centers, other places, number one, they usually come as the victim. And they're very needy. They're hurting. They're in pain. They're victims. And that's probably true of the upfront personality of, of those who are up front. But it's not true about the inside stuff. Jesus said for us to be wise, listen, meek as doves, wise as serpents. You're going to have to have this this wonderful compassion of Christ to show, along with the idea of guarding everything uh, spiritually with discernment and with uh, perception of the Holy Spirit. And, and literally, like we'll talk about here, like Nehemiah. Nehemiah, on the one hand, had a brick. He was building. and He was doing ministry. In the other hand, he had a sword. That's what I think we, as uh, in this day, that the, the whole ramping up of uh, the demonic agenda, the satanic agenda, is, is occurring worldwide. Because again, the church is probably 30 years behind in this in their understanding of all of it, and and it's it's not going to go away. There's more demonized people in the United States than ever in history, and we're seeing it happen all across the United States and all kinds of ministries. But we're seeing the multiple, the cult multiple, the satanic chosen one um, showing up in churches all over the place, many churches. I can, I can name vineyard churches and I can name other churches that uh, local independent uh, evangelical churches and charismatic churches that have literally shut down because of the havoc that occurred when they had no idea what hit them. They come in, number one, usually as the victim. They have need and so forth. And so they're going to come in and you're going to feel you know, like you want to help them and do everything. But that's how they'll come in at first, as victim, as needy, uh, someone who needs help, someone who's going to tell you horrific stories of abuse and um, begin to tell you things. You might even do some light-level deliverance with them, um, but you may have not gotten to the rest of them. Think of it as like a tree. The, their, their inside is like a tree with many limbs. And you may engage a top branch, but you haven't engaged all the other limbs and branches in the system uh, that was created within them. So you're going to have to be very, very discerning and seek the Spirit of God's guidance and build your knowledge. Number two, they seek association. They seek likeness. In other words, they want, you know what they'll do? They'll begin to look and read you and your staff members, and they'll say, you know, they're going to look inside, they're going to look for what is, what, what, are, you, what are your favorite, uh, what your foods, what do you like to drink, uh, what movies, what, you know, what are your hobbies, what do you like, what are the interesting things that you're, you know, you're into. You know what? They will adapt. Matter of fact, they might bring you gifts of the very favorite things you're into. They may begin to say, man, I like, if you love books, oh, I love books. If you love uh, Arizona green tea and you love that as a favorite drink like I do, uh, they love Arizona green tea. It, you know, per, Matter of fact, we had one individual that was coming to church doing all these things. I would sit as a pastor in the front pew ready to go forward to do ministry, whatever. They would always have to, no matter what, sit exactly behind me. I would move down to the other side of the pew. They would move down. They, this person, this individual, dyed their hair the exact color of my wife's hair. There was a sense of likeness that they liked you so much and even give you compliments. And, and, uh, and so they do this for the sake of vulnerability to get you to trust them, to get you to think, wow, this person, I'm really identifying with this person, and uh, they're really neat, and uh, they like what I like. And you begin to share common interests or you know, certain movies or certain books, 
and you think you become buddies and chums. They love that. They want to draw that in. That's why you're going to see some who have succeeded. I mean, they're right there in the pastor's home. They're right there in the head of the parachurch ministries, uh, you know, leaders' offices and home, and they're all over the place because of the sense of uh, association and likeness. That's how they get in. Thirdly, they they consume time. They 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 call you. They you, they got to, You've got to come and see them. Uh, they want to hang out. They want to come to the building. Um, and so all of a sudden you find yourself not just in the counseling hour, but you know there's lunch time, getting together later, going to see a movie, hanging out time. They want to hang out, but again, it's because they want to do reconnaissance. They want to assess you. They want to build a file on you. They want to begin to see where your vulnerabilities are for the sake of uh, for the sake of um, compromising you. And they'll do that. We have guys that have been taken places even, and pictures were taken of them. Uh, pictures were taken of them by others in the coven. Uh, we were drawn out one time, and one of the personalities inside was going to take us and show us a satanic site. But it seemed like they could never find the exact site, and they'd go from place to place to place. And we found out that they were taking pictures of us. They had the coven waiting and looking and observing us and seeing our team. Uh, this is This is part of what they do. Number four. They will, um, as they get in, uh, they will give old or diversionary information. In other words, you might be listening and think, wow, they're telling us about such and such doctor who is a child abuser, has child porn, you know, this and that, or the, such and such military base, or this scientist, or this doctor, or this pastor, and uh, they, may, they may want to take you out to show you places. When you begin to see that all the information they give you is old, and sometimes diversionary, that you can't really use the information they get to nail to nail some real bad perpetrator, then you're going to realize something. That either they themselves are completely duped by the inside cult loyal personalities, or they're literally running you around. The upfront personalities are running you around, you know, doing all kinds of stuff while they're still reading you, while they're still doing satanic attack and, and ritual warfare against you, and uh, uh, consuming your time. Old and diversionary information to, to draw you in, to make you interested, to cause you to give more time. Five, they will eventually seem to be everywhere. Hey, they're in your office. They're at your church, you know, church. They're there late. They stay at the end of the service. They wait to the very end. They want to be the last person. They want to come to your home. They after they find out your favorite food place, they're going to show up there. Uh, all of a sudden, when you see those who are infiltrating, they end up being everywhere. Um, and uh, you'll notice sometimes you'll be doing something in the church, and you'll look to the right. There they are, staring at you. Um, they're going to be consuming. Uh, uh, you in the sense of that they're simply everywhere. They want to be your helper. They want to be your friend. They want to be one of you. But don't forget. I mean, listen. They want the reason is because they want to go deeper. They want to. They want you to eventually invite them to be a part of the ranks and and to get into the body and to get into the leadership and so forth. This has happened many times with those that I've worked with. Definitely, they were not healed. They even we got to the point where they knew that they had caught loyal parts. Uh, I mean, some really wicked things inside, but yet they wanted, you know, hey, I don't want to go through all the levels of training. Just take me in personally and train me, teach me. We had a guy that came in that um, sat with us and shared uh, all, the, beginning to share us all these gory and bloody and horror, horror stories of his life. Uh, what he didn't know is that we've already been through this a number of times. So once again, as he is in talking to us, because we already knew what he was pretty much about, we had people taking pictures of him, uh, running his license plate, uh, doing reconnaissance on him, and prayer mapping him, and going over. Our job was to do it redemptively, but also to expose what's going on here. This person continued to ask about being baptized. He wanted to become a member of the church. Um, but I kept challenging his spiritual, you know, are you born again? Are you really a believer? Do you really know Jesus Christ? And when it came down to the brass tacks of, no, I'm not going to baptize you, not because I don't like you, not because I don't want to help you, but because you're not a born-again believer. I don't perceive this. You can't confess it with your mouth. And uh, you're confessing that you read the Bible, that you'll go to church, that you want to be baptized. 
But it seemed like there was a, a drivenness on his side to see how far he can get in and be among us. He kept telling us how he felt God was maybe wanting him to be here among us, to be a shatter worker, to get in our organization, to be a part of us, on and on and on. Now, we've seen this before, to infiltrate shatter, to get involved with us. And uh, in the early days, we've seen harm when we've let you know individuals that were unhealed begin to work with us in the sense of helping out doing paperwork or doing stuff in the office, uh, making copies on a copy machine. They may do that, but if they're unhealed and they got caught loyal parts, those other parts inside are going to scrutinize your office. They're going to do take some, you know, uh, ritual anointing oil and or demonized objects and put in that office. They're going to put curses on individuals. They're going to communicate all their stuff uh, to the coven folks about your uh, inner office workings, and uh, they're going to do things uh, all the while they're smiling and copying paper for you and helping you. That's how it works. And um, I wish we had this heads up in the beginning, but we know now, um, and we're learning even more and more as we continue to go along with this and uh, continue the ministry. Six, they want to serve. Now here again is where some of them will begin to say, I'm more healed, I'm more healed, I'm really healed, I don't think there's anything inside, etc., etc., now again, when you find them, especially when you know they're not completely healed and they're really driven, I want to be in the children's ministry. Uh, I want to be on stage singing. Uh, I want to be able to get up and, and, and take the microphone and share. Now listen, we dealt with a multiple one time years ago uh, that he would uh, even send us, we were getting these cassette tapes in the mail of a British sounding guy out of Sheffield, England, talking about the individual that we were dealing with, telling us to stay away, warning us uh, that he would kill us, that he did have a gun, all these things like that. Um, this individual that we dealt with, he had other personalities call our office and, and uh, you know cuss us out and tell us to stay away. Let's just call him Joe. That's not his real name, but to stay away from Joe. Well, a number of times I went to the church that he attends. And I watched right in his church, which we knew there were two or three multiples doing this. They had open mic time, probably seven, eight hundred people there, and he would go forward and take the mic and share a little bit about Jesus and, and talk a little bit. But there I am way out there in the crowd looking at him, knowing that he has cult committed, satanic committed personalities inside, uh, that he's there as an infiltrator. I went another time to that place, and I'd seen him earlier on in the service, at the end of the service, of course, seven, eight hundred people moving around, you know, everything's over. All of a sudden, I really feel something really weird. I turn around, and through the crowd, clear across the other side, he's staring at me. I walk over to this guy, let's call him Joe, and Joe looks at me and says, I felt you when you walked in. Now, this is a common thing, because satanic warrior monks are trained, they are trained and demonically gifted with counterfeit workings of word of knowledge and discernments and other things. Uh, psychic abilities and so forth, telekinesis, clairvoyance, um, all kinds of things. The ability, it, they claim to read minds, and in a certain level they can do a little bit of that because they're trained to be super soldiers, transmuted, higher human beings, uh, to have these powers in them located in the blood. They want to serve. They want to get involved. Now, this same guy was doing harm, um, and the weird thing about it, uh, he, in the context of what he was doing there and infiltrating and the harm that he was doing otherwise, uh, he died. I don't know what occurred in that situation. I just know that in, as a young, unhealed cult multiple, um, he died. We wanted to help him. We wanted to minister to him. Um, but he absolutely would not engage us in any freedom encounter or prayer time. Let me tell you, number seven, they can't wait to give you gifts. They love to give you gifts. They want to give you things and things that you like, a book, a, uh, an, an object, a, 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 you know, a picture, a painting, whatever it may be, they want to give you gifts. They may not know it, but the cult loyal inside personalities most likely have demonized those objects. 
use them in a ritual format, put demonic presence on it with a with a target of causing you you know sickness or harm or or plundering your finances, whatever. It is a demonized object. You're going to notice that they want to give it to you and make sure that you have it, either on your person or that you put it in your office or that you've taken it to your home. They may leave those objects around the ha- uh, your church or your office. They may have objects around that are like, again, whether you understand the spiritual realm or not, they can demonize an object in, in, in a ritual and then uh, that presence beyond there, like the girl that came to my office, that the demonized power rings that she used to wear left in my uh, left in my couch in the office purposely. I didn't know the agenda at the time, and back then I didn't know to pray it through and really seek the Lord on the agenda, other than we knew that the Holy Spirit said that it was uh, they were demonically charged. Of course, we prayed against things, we did the same thing. And on demonized objects like that, the best thing you do is just burn them, like Josiah in uh, Second Kings. 21, 22, 23, when he got a hold of the demonized objects and the demonized symbols and things like that, of course he would get rid of them. Uh, You may at times um, have them bring you food, your favorite foods. Let me tell you again a story that's going to make you think twice about accepting food because they're going to get offended if you don't like to take their gifts or if you're not wearing their shirt or their jacket or whatever else it is they gave you. They're the kind of people that will get very offended. Why aren't you wearing this? Why aren't you? I can't believe you. Didn't. You know they're going to get very offended and feel really bad and and put you try to put you on a guilt trip to wear the demonized or to have the demonized object uh, on you or close to you so that it will ha- take its effect. And uh, we they do the same thing with foods. Now we had an individual like we had one individual that you know they really knew that I liked green Arizona green tea, and they are constantly wanting to buy me. And you know I I got a perception of the one individual. Very strongly, you know, they brought it to me ice cold. Man, it was really great. So I tried something. I I didn't open. I just set it to the side. During the entire time in the session, they kept looking at it, waiting. Pretty soon, you know, I could see them getting bothered. Why didn't you open your green tea? Aren't you going to drink your green tea? It's really cold right now. Uh, I'll get to it later. I said this went on for a while to where the point they're getting angry. They didn't want to leave until I opened it and drank out of that bottle. And I never opened it, and I never drank out of that bottle. I cannot tell you how many bottles of green tea I've thrown away. I've made it a rule, and I've trained staff members and others in our in our surveillance in our in our in one of the one of the training things we do. Uh, no matter what, just make it a principle: you don't eat any food, take any gifts, take any objects, nothing from cult multiples, unhealed cult multiples. Don't you know they can take it personally if they want to, but it's just a principle. I tell them, hey, it's our principle. That's what we do. Thank you for the the kindness, but but uh, we we cannot. And let me tell you one of the things that occurred. Pastoring a larger church one time, a few of the cult multiples had shown up, and one of them that came from a psych ward showed up, and uh, they wanted to bring me gifts. They wanted to do things. Well, one day during our, they found out when we met a staff. The whole staff, nine people, met uh, on a, on a. Tuesday for the staff meetings for a couple hours and prayer and, and discussion. Well, all of a sudden they arrived with a cake for our staff meeting. I felt weird about it in the beginning. Carrying the cake upstairs, I felt weird about it. You know, we cut the cake and and you know what I said to the folks? I said, you know what? This came from a cult multiple and I'm not sure about it. I feel really weirded out about it. I, I'm not going to eat any. Someone else, you know, grabbed a piece of it and said, "I don't care. I don't care what they've done. I, I you know, I'm going to go ahead and eat a piece." And they, they started to, and I took the entire cake and I took it to the trash and I just dumped it. Let me tell you what occurred. A few years later, this same individual came back after being out west, going through other uh, ministry. They confessed that they made that cake, urinated in the batter. And uh, whether they ritualized it or not, I'm not sure. They didn't, I forget what they said about that part of it. But they urinated in the batter and brought the cake as part of a uh, part of what they do. And uh, it would have been all the staff eating that. So I'm going to tell you again, uh, you're going to make a principle about this. Uh, and ours simply is this, I don't accept gifts and uh, and foods and things like that. And uh, we don't accept money from them either. Any victim that we deal with, it's our rule. We will not accept donations from a victim. If they're healed, you know, down the road later, they want to come back or they want to support, that's fine. But during the time, our, our, our rule is to be, you know, you're, you're not permitted to, to try to give us money. Let me give you number eight, then we're going to go on to how do you respond. All the time that these, uh, the, the, all this is going on, 
there are coven loyal, Luciferian loyal personalities. Again, they're seeking to do um, warfare. They're uh, taking information back to the coven. You can be sure that if you have a cult multiple, a real cult multiple before you in ministry, you can be sure that they're connected and outside of your offices in church, there are handlers, enforcers, uh, watchers, other coven members. They may even send into your practice or fake coming in like a victim if you're ministering to one of theirs, send them, they might come in and fake like they're a victim to observe, get reconnaissance and see what you're doing with their, with their people. They know this. Call multiples to the coven and to the military black ops covens. Um, that's their property. And you're, you're messing with their property. So you may get threats and things like that anyway. And again, that's on another series that we're doing. Um, the issue of threats and everything. But they're going to come in um, and observe you also. So you need to assume immediately that everybody, every every cult model you're dealing with uh, will have others behind them, um, whether visiting the congregation, whether doing ritual against you, so that if you uh, go backwards and prayer map them and begin to pray the exposure and so forth, that's how we have found other covenant members other uh, ritual sites where they meet where they do things and again that's another uh, session as far as counter infiltration and uh, working uh, backwards in that sense well I'm going to get to the main point really of this and we only have got about uh, 15 minutes left to go over the issues of what do you do then if you have a cult multiple if you're in ministry that deals with cult multiples maybe you're somebody who's really advanced you know Write us and tell us some things that you guys have learned. That's great. Our job has always been to go anywhere in the country, any conference, any place we could to learn everything we can. Number one, to see individuals saved, healed, delivered. Number two, to see you know protection also done uh, with others. And, and, and we've also learned that, that, and again, this is going to be hard for some people to understand. Excuse me, to understand. Um, I'm going to guarantee you right now, not everybody wants to be healed, delivered. You know, when you get down to the core things, some people, when they get down to every, you know, right down to the Luciferian core committed, you know, majority of the will, um, you're going to find out that some of these folks choose to go back. That they don't choose your side. And you've got to understand that there are those who don't want to give up their powers, they don't want to give up their elitism. They don't want to give up their rank. They don't, and they believe in the promises, the Luciferian promises, and the things that they're going to get. And that's a sad thing, um, but that's true uh, with some of them too. So you have to be a person like Nehemiah that has a brick in one hand, the idea of building ministry, doing ministry, doing the work of God, doing what Jesus did, doing the works of Jesus. On the other side, you're going to have to have carry a sword, a spiritual sword, so that you have, um, like Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, when it says, devote yourself to prayer, being watchful. Now you look up the Greek word. Watchful there has the idea of having an alert perception concerning impending danger. If you are sensing impending danger, uh, if you have Holy Spirit perception, discernment, which we're going to talk about. So what do you do? What do you do as a believer uh, in a counseling, Christian counseling service or a church or a pastor and so forth? Here, here, I'm going to give you, I think, real quick here, 16 of the things that I think are very important. I could probably take two or three hours going over all these, but in 15 minutes or so I'm going to give you 16 principles that we found that are important. Number one, grip the reality of spiritual warfare. The church has been birthed in the context of the gates of hell, uh, of battle. We've been born um, out of the, the grips of Satan uh, into the um, uh, kingdom of God, and we are um, enemies of the state, per se. We are in a battle. Every soul saved. It's a battle, spiritual battle. The advance of the church, spiritual battle. That's why Jesus gave us authority. And most of the church still doesn't understand uh, or appropriate the authority of Christ, Luke chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, or the armor of God. Many Christians in seminars, I find that more than half don't understand what it really means to have the armor of God on. So grip the reality of spiritual warfare. They're real. It's all real. And the ramping up in biblical prophecy tells us that it'll be more and more and more uh, unprecedented in, in the history of humanity will be the demonic manifestation, the demonic workings, um, 
and the days that we're living up to the days of the rise of the Antichrist and the return of Christ. Uh, so we're going to see so many things. So grip the reality. Read what you can. Study what you can. Appropriate uh, the biblical truths and, and, and live it out in a daily way. Live out your life as a worshiper, as a soul winner, as a witness for Christ, but also as a warrior unleashing spiritual authority against dark powers and uh, getting yourself trained to be spiritually sensitive um, uh, to that vein of carrying the brick of ministry, carrying the sword of spiritual warfare, and doing uh, both at the same time. Number two, Holy Spirit Perception, HSP. Holy Spirit Perception, you've been given the gift of the Spirit of God. Uh, we pray that we would be filled and saturated and soaked with the Spirit of God, not only for our joy and the life that we have in Christ and uh, the, the uh, beauty of uh, worship and embracing God, my friend, but also the Spirit's perception and ministry and witnessing and sharing and doing all that we do, including Holy Spirit perception in spiritual warfare. Spiritually, by the Spirit of God, perceiving the workings, the hidden stealth workings of the enemy. Acts chapter 5, here comes Ananias and Sapphira. Satan has entered into their very beings to try to infiltrate the church. Peter by the Spirit of God knows this. And of course, you know the encounter in Acts chapter 5, where Ananias and Sapphira both drop dead at the doors of the church um, by a judgment from God. The judgment was on Satan's entrance and on their lie. But Peter had Holy Spirit, maybe a word of knowledge, maybe it was pure discernment, but Holy Spirit perception. Pray that God will give you Holy Spirit perception. Look for Him to give you guidance, speak to you, direct you by the work of the Holy Spirit in uh, ministering in the area of spiritual warfare. This is true as far as intercessors. When you're spending uh, a lot of time, uh, when you learn to spend a lot of time on praying against the dark powers, the Holy Spirit can guide you and, and direct you and aim your prayers. Uh, check out the Shadow of the Darkness um, prayer mapping that's on our website and on prayer mapping and how we do prayer mapping and in targeted, strategic, focused prayer mapping. Uh, we found it has an incredible, incredible work. Uh, uh, and that's how I think we've been protected and how we've uncovered so much along the way. Remember, they operate in some of the deepest uh, satanic powers, rituals of invisibility, rituals and demonic uh, things that they've sent and done and prayers and signals that are used to keep you blinded. And you need the Spirit of God's perception and, and direction to uh, once again overwhelm the dark side and to triumph over them by the cross of Christ. Uh, Colossians 2.15 Number three, preemptive prophecy. Look up all, uh, end time prophecy. You're going to see the majority of all end time prophecy is not on the second coming, which that is the central theme, but um, it's on don't be deceived. Uh, false prophets, false teachers, counterfeit signs, wonders, and miracles. The operation, the supernatural secret uh, power, uh, the secret power of lawlessness, the hidden power that's operating in the world. And uh, as you understand prophecy and understand it clearly, you're going to see the incredible ramping up and be able to say, hey, this is that which the Word of God told us about. What, what prophecy in the New Testament is, God sees the real agenda of Satan down the road. He sees exactly what Satan's going to do in real history, real time, everything. And he has given us snapshots in biblical prophecy in the New Testament and shown us some of his Satan's strategic methods, uh, his strategic uh, moves and uh, workings. And we need to know them very, very well if you're going to be a good witness and warrior for Christ. Number four, get a current assessment of the time we live in. Now, you may not understand this, but there are over four million diagnosed cases of multiple personality disorder uh, the majority of those, Holly Hector at Centennial Hospital said, 87% are satanic ritual abuse. We found that 95% are satanic ritual abuse. The secular world, uh, that is, those without the Spirit of Christ in, in moving and in, in, in trying to help in this area, will not be able uh, to do the same level of uncovering and bring ministry and, 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 and supernatural healing to these folks uh, the way that Jesus wants to do it. Let me just say this. The current assessment is, at this point, 
the 70s, 60s, you've never seen any of it, anything like this, uh, as far as cult multiples. 70s, a few uh, victims were showing up, 80s, 90s. Now we're at, at the year 2007, and there's probably close to 5 million diagnosed cases. What this tells me statistically, too, and we said this in, in 1992, we said it in 94, in seminars and conferences, that... Um, Half, if not more than half, of cult multiples have not been to a psych ward. They are intact. They are operating under their uh, satanic design. And they're handled and so forth. And so there's probably another 5 million, well over 10 million of them. My friend, where do they come from? Why are they here? Why are they in probably just about every church in the United States? Why are they in law enforcement, military, government? Why are they in the you know CIA? Why are they in the NSA? Why are they all over the place? And uh, this is something that is at the core of Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse. Uh, well, as you go down through, you're going to see the secret power of lawlessness, uh, Satan's working, inner gaze, his supernatural demonic working in in bringing about the Antichrist. Dear friends, in the satanic agenda, Satan needs troops to clear the way and eventually enthrone Antichrist, and he needs them everywhere. And you and I are living in those very days. They count on your ignorance. They count on your ignorance. They get angry when you begin to know their stuff. They love to live in... St their, their power really is in their stealth ability. And uh, they love to do things without you knowing it, hitting you up without you knowing it, causing division, destruction without you knowing it, and then moving on. Number five. Uh, well, four, you just need to have current assessment. You need to really know. You need to really take a look at all of it. Number five. No toleration of demonic presence, deception, uh, no toleration of uh, you know impending danger. You've got to make sure that you're not tolerating saying, oh, we want to sympathetically work with this multiple and allow them into all kinds of places, endangering children and other people. Um, you know what? I've had it, multiples come to me and it's like, they're really kind of mad at me and sad. I won't let them in the offices. I won't let them uh, serve. I won't let them get in children's ministry, They, you know, whatever else. And I tell them, listen, you've got personalities inside that have been sexually abused. You've got caught loyal personalities inside. Why would you think I'm going to let you do that? In a, well, I can control it. No, you can't. You lose time. You lose an hour at a time. What happens when the cult loyal personalities take over and do things? So no toleration. Jesus said, you know, concerning the seven churches revelation, he was bugged with the church that tolerated Jezebel. You know, he was, he was uh, commending the church that would not tolerate the Nicolaitans, the cultic teaching uh, that was seeking to infiltrate the church. My friends, no toleration of demonic activity. Rather, uh, you know, ex expose them, expel them, deal with that. If an individual multiple says, well, I'm not coming back unless you let me work with the children, say goodbye to them. Save the children, and uh, if they really want help, they'll understand what needs to be done to protect everybody and keep everybody safe. Number six. If you have them among you right now, um, the goal is redemptive and protective at the same time. Brick and sword, as we've already said. Um, the goal is redemptive and protective all at the same time. You're ministering the salvation, the grace, the healing, the deliverance, everything you can do to bring them deliverance. And I think that Isaiah um, 50, uh, 58 deals with this uh, very well. In, in uh, loosing them from the yoke, every yoke, spending yourself on behalf of them. But you have to also uh, be protective. Otherwise, you may be completely wore out um, and burned out and, and ritually, you know, warfared against so much that uh, you're, you just will never do I, We know there's a lot of casualties in this, war, in, in this whole realm. A lot of casualties. So you need to make sure that you're doing it redemptively and at the exact same time with protection and spiritual warfare. And uh, you're, you're to attack the demonic realm. Uh, you're to bring healing to the human realm. And um, it's very important that you do like Nehemiah did. Do it at the same time in every case. Seven, prayer saturation without, without question. Pouring out the prayer, saturating everything with prayer. Number eight, 
keeping the focus of the church. Don't let your church be turned into, you know, sermons and everything about it turned into a multiple church or a church just deals with, with this alone. Keep the mission uh, 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 of the Great Commission operating. Keep worship operating and continue. Nine. Uh, build knowledge. Get more and more knowledge. All the knowledge you can. Uh, like Daniel. Look at chapter one in Daniel. Understand what they're doing. Understand their principles. You know, and uh, use it redemptively and use it in a spiritual warfare sense. Ten. Uh, never let a multiple serve in children and youth ministry. I've already said that. Eleven. Uh, get um, preemptive uh, repentance. In this sense, I mean, what I mean by this is that, um, you know, if they're repenting and and doing things, there's going to be uh, reactions, uh, you know, ha- happening. And um, what you want to do in, in this sense, I guess what I'm trying to say is, for you to repent of any sin and anything else in your own life, and have your life be clean and strong before the Lord as you're going in to deal with these folks, because you're dealing with again satanic warrior monks. They really know their business. Twelve. Have a strong biblical faith, Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, be like David when it came to David and Goliath. Be, be willing to get out of the rocks and go down to the field in the name of the Lord, deal with the demonic, deal with the stuff, and work at it and pray and work through things and uh, build yourself up and, and work in teams is vital too. 13, as I said before, where there's one of them, there's more. And understand, I asked a girl one time, how many is in this area? She said, oh, at least 2,000 in the greater Akron, northeast Ohio area. And uh, so we're praying in our prayer mapping to find victims, to find, and we do, we find them that way. They don't have to come to us, we're now going to them. Fourteen, the Josiah principle, the Josiah factor, Second Kings, chapter 21, 22, 23. Um, expose the demonic, expel the demonic, uh, see the demonic uh, objects uh, destroyed. Um, you need to take a strong view against the demonic realm. First uh, John, chapter 3, verse... 8 says this, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy Satan's works. So that's what you're doing also in bringing inner healing, salvation, deliverance. It's destroying the satanic side of things. When they bring you objects and things like that, fine. If you want to take a picture of them, that's fine. Go burn them. Go have a time where you burn them, crush them, so forth. Uh, 15. Create within your own church a special ministry, special ministry working just on this subject so that you don't consume the church. Uh, get a specialized team that will focus on this. And then 16, look at the bigger picture. The bigger picture is, uh, again, 16, uh, I'm sorry, 16 is, um, the bigger picture is there's a 4 uh, to 5 million diagnosed cases, another 5 million. There's a larger agenda out there, my friends, and uh, the rise, the ramping up of demonic evil is absolutely uh, incredible this time. You cannot hide from it. You cannot uh, back away. You cannot just say, listen, we want a nicer world. Um, we're going to see what Jesus talked about, unprecedented times. We're going to see that these times are going to shake nations, shake the world, shake the core of humanity. We're going to see uh, far more evil than we ever seen among the Nazis we're going to see uh, the most horrific uh, and ugly things. The things that have been done uh, under the table now for 60 years have come to the surface. They're ready to pounce on the world around us. And I want to encourage you to get a hold of my um, sessions on the Black Awakening because I can, I can only tell you now and plead with you now if you're a spiritual leader that, that there is a vast satanic army uh, that we're coming to the times of the rise of Antichrist, that there's going to be vast persecution, c- tremendous chaos before the new world order, and uh, we need to be prepared as tremendous Christian leaders. Study Nehemiah, the powerful leadership of Nehemiah, the wonderful spiritual depth and purity of Daniel and his commitment. Uh, those two uh, uh, biblical characters and the principles of their lives need to be employed Let me encourage you that Jesus Christ will win. Jesus Christ has won. Jesus Christ can save and deliver and heal anybody. Trust in the supernatural workings of God. Ask God for the great healing and work, even extraordinary miracles. 
Uh, you'll have to get the series on the healing of multiples. Uh, that's going to, again, take another hour, two hours to go over that. But trust in the Lord your God. Jesus Christ is the only one that can handle this kind of thing. His authority, His um, His mercy, His grace, His protection. Psalm 91, know that your God loves you and, and, and protects you. But be a brave spiritual warrior for Christ and uh, get out there and minister. Refresh yourself. Build yourself up in the Lord. Take the times you need to to re-encourage yourself. Work in a team where you can pray for each other and cover each other. And listen, pray for us. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, www.shatterthedarkness.net on the web. All the contact information is there. Email us. And for any of the chosen ones that have got a hold of this, you're listening. We're praying for you. We're praying that God deliver you. You're a victim of that Luciferian project. We want you to come out. Jesus Christ uh, has been has died for you, rose from the dead. His power can deliver you. And for any Luciferian handlers listening, Jesus said it'd be better for you you to be have a millstone tied around your neck to be thrown in the deepest sea than to face him in the judgment. You need to repent. You need to repent. You need to stop it. You need to turn on the Luciferian agenda. You need to expose it. You need to help out. You need to be redeemed. Do it now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, this is Russ Dizdar. God bless you.